Welcome to Valley Politics. I'm Terry Christensen. Today we'll meet Nicole Taylor, the president and CEO of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. She'll brief us on how the foundation works, and we'll talk about the state of philanthropy in the Valley and funding for small nonprofits and organizations that represent people of color, as well as support for the arts and civic engagement. And we'll have questions from representatives of those groups. And that's what's coming up on Valley Politics. Welcome everyone and welcome Nicole Taylor, President and CEO of the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Oh, thank you, thank you, it's good to be here. We're happy to have you with us. Let's start with just a quick overview sure. of how the, how the Community Foundation works. Sure, so at the, at the core of what we do is we bring together resources and skills of donors, companies, government, community to solve the region's toughest problems. And we work with also, we work with donors and philanthropists as well as corporate partners to help carry out their own philanthropy. And what all that means is we're, we're in a position to really meet ongoing needs and challenges, unexpected challenges like maybe a pandemic, <laughs> renewed calls for racial justice, wildfires, and you know, in 2020, a fraud election season. And we do this by promoting philanthropy, not just with our own donors and our, you know, the folks who work directly with us, but in our region. And we work with other foundations, we work with other philanthropists to really figure out how they can invest their dollars to have the greatest impact. And we do advocacy, we do research, we do public policy work and grant making, all at really getting to systemic solutions that drive our community, that, you know, that can really drive our community forward. Um, you know, we really are focusing in on our two counties, San Mateo County and Santa Clara County. Um, although we, we have an impact region-wide, um, our donors distributed $1.9 billion in grants in 2020, and $523 million of that stayed right here in the Bay Area, which really meant that we were the largest supporter of nonprofits in the Bay Area because of our donors. Our donors are really I think 2020 proved that um, giving local and investing right here in our local communities was critically important. So we, we play that role. We, play, you know, we highlight what's going on in communities. We work with those who have the resources, financial resources and otherwise, and we do the marriage. We make the connections. That's in essence what we do. And that's really what community foundations everywhere do. But we're you know, really fortunate in this region, a 10 county barrier region to have eight community foundations and we work closely with all of them. We did throughout the pandemic, you know, um, it, although, you know, each of us kind of focus on a specific geographical area within the Bay Area, um, we recognize that as a region, many of these issues do not know county boundaries, right? They don't know city boundaries. And so there's a lot of partnership with the community foundations in the Bay. It's really, I'm really proud of that and really excited about it. Well, tell us a little bit more, bit more about what you did during the pandemic, mm -hmm. what you've been doing. Yeah, I've been doing still, right. It's continuing. Of your work. Right. Well, I arrived in, um, you know, late 20, it was even 20, 2019, basically. I started January 2019 in full force. And about mid-year of 2019, we started a strategic planning process. And the reason I'm taking you all the way back there is because in 2020, we ended up living into the new strategic direction that we had started plotting out from mid 2019 because we listened to board members, staff members, donors, community leaders, nonprofit partners, government leaders. And um, they were, everyone was telling us they wanted us to be more embedded in the community. I came up with this um, phrase that I used, um, you know, we needed to put the community back in the community foundation. And that's what we were hearing in, across all of the listening sessions we were doing and the town halls we were doing and the one-on-one -on -one interviews we were doing. We also heard that donors didn't just want us to be passive. They wanted us to really engage with them. You know, some know exactly what they want to do, but many want to, you know, want advice, want to know where to give, want to know who's having the most impact. So that, that's what we worked on in our strategic plan and then 2020 happened and COVID happened and racial justice happened. So we were able to respond because we had a framework to work, work under. 
um, you know, one of the key pillars was reducing systemic disparities. And we focused on equity and the inequities that existed prior to COVID, but what COVID exposed. That, you know, the most, the folks facing the most vulnerable circumstances are communities of color. Um, those with undocumented status are low income and their extremely low income neighbors. And we focused on that in, in the pandemic. You know, we, we really wanted to um, highlight that and ensure that our donors were giving and knew where to give, which is one of our other key pillars from our strategic plan is developing this culture of effective philanthropy, that your philanthropy can be catalytic to our communities. And it has to also be in alignment with community leadership and action. It can't just be in isolation. You have to work hand in hand with community. Um, and so that's what we did. We launched a regional fund. I talked about the partnership with the, the other community foundations. We launched a regional fund for the 10 County Bay Area. Um, we worked with the community foundations as well as lead agencies in each of the counties and raised $64 million and have so far helped almost 645,000 individuals and families. And that means rent, rent assistance, financial assistance, food assistance, um, our donors gave out almost $250 million to COVID related work um, through 2020. Um, our own grant making, we made it quite nimble, you know, let's get these dollars out to the organizations that, that are doing the work. Um, and really partnered also with, um, you know, local government companies and others. I was part of uh, what Mayor Ricardo convened, the Silicon Valley recovery roundtable. He asked me to be co-chair and a good deal of our summer and early fall was spent trying to identify once we get out of the pandemic, what is it, what is it going to look like to, to recover? So I was honored to be part of that. And um, that's just a little bit of what we did. We also did work on racial justice um, right after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, there was, you know, cries for racial justice and their donors were really asking for help. Where do we give how do we learn about what is going on? So we created a you know racial and, and social justice page on our website that has videos, articles, readings that people can can really engage in, as well as where to give. Um, you know, we sent out a black led organization giving guide to our to our donors so that they would understand what organizations are working locally in the black community, as well as nationally on efforts of racial justice. Um, you know, so that kind of gives you a little bit of sense of what we do. We also launched funds when the wildfires happened, specifically to help uh, displaced um, folks living in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties. So it was a busy, busy year, and I haven't even touched on our engagement in the election season. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, but this is what we're supposed to do. This is what a community foundation does. Well, that's a lot, and it's a big change from where the community foundation was before you arrived, and a huge response to the crisis of, of the moment. Let me ask you to zoom mm -hmm. out for a minute and think sure. about Silicon Valley donors more generally. Yep. Because yep. In the past, there's been serious criticism that they give much more to programs mm -hmm. and projects outside the valley, right. internationally, nationally, than to local projects right. and programs. Right. Do you think that's still true, and what's the community foundation done to address that? Right, it is not true. It, there is no longer true. Um, we've actually seen the opposite happen. And I think it took the pandemic for people to realize, hey, our own backyard is burning. And literally it was, right? It, it, during the fires, but literally um, individuals, families and companies recognized the need to take care of their own backyard. And I have to point out that one of um, our key CEOs in the Valley, Chuck Robbins of Cisco, has been talking about this and beating the drum on this for, for some years and it really came to fruition uh, and his work with his peer, his peer CEOs and, and companies in the Valley it really came to fruition in 2020 when a lot of folks realized, wait a minute, we need to be taking care of what's happening locally. Now, companies that you know, we're in the Valley and global tech companies do have presence in other, in other countries and have employees in other countries. So that we will always have, because we work with 60 companies, we will always do international grant making because they, to help them you know, with their philanthropic goals in terms of where their footprints are. Um, but our international grant making actually decreased. It was 82 million in 2019 and 60 million in 2020. And overall grants, I, I talk, you know, um, 
$523 million to Bay Area nonprofits. And um, that's pretty incredible. The other thing I wanna um, clarify, because there's, there's also, I think, perception that all of our donors are the ultra high net worth, the billionaires, if you will, right? A lot of people think that that's, those are our, all of our donors. That is a small subset of our donors. A vast majority of our donors are regular folks who might have done well and wanted to figure out how to give back to their community. We have a lot of donors that have funds under $100,000, like closer to the $85,000 uh, fund size. And of course, we have larger uh, funds and donors who have the capacity to give tremendous amounts of resources away, and they do. Um, so, you know, what uh, I think the, the story of our actual everyday donor gets lost sometimes because um, the light is shown on, you know, some of our larger donors who have the ability and really do enjoy giving at, at quite a substantial level, both here and, and other places. So, um, so we're seeing the change. We're seeing the change. Um, and I think it's going to stay because we're all seeing you know, our favorite small businesses shut down from restaurants to markets, you know, to uh, dry cleaners, all of these things that were the fabric of our, of all the towns up and down the peninsula and the South Bay. Everyone saw, has seen it. Everyone has seen what the toll that uh, the pandemic and the economic crisis that resulted. Everyone's seen it. And so our donors see it and they want to know and they ask us, you know, how, how do we make a difference? Where, where do we give? and they've been turning locally. Yeah, speaking of some of your smaller mm -hmm. uh, foundation accounts, uh, you maintain uh, a couple of scholarship accounts for yes. students at San Jose Poli Sci students, my students. Oh, good, uh, good. The state that go back, gosh, probably uh, 20 years. Oh, good. Our, yeah, it, this is high season right now for scholarships. And, yeah, um, so important. It, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear that. That, that, and the donors that. just felt more comfortable with the community foundation than they did with our own university. Oh. <laughs> so well done. Thank you. Uh, Nicole, we're going to go to the first question from sure. our guests. And this is from Angelica Cortez, mm -hmm. uh, lead Filipino. Mm -hmm. Here's Angelica. Hi, Nicole. The community has long appreciated its deep partnership with the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. As industry, public, and charitable sectors continue to expand their definitions and practices around racial equity, may you share with us how SBCF is approaching their recruitment and outreach strategies with small, minority, and women-led nonprofits and community organizations that might otherwise not have previously had the professional markers or budget thresholds to meet SBCF's grantee eligibility requirements. Thank you. I am actually really excited about what we're doing now. Again, with our uh, new strategic direction, we are focusing on equity. The equity lens is, and, and the racial lens is what we apply to all of our work. And we have, um, one, I've launched a community advisory council that actually advises me, and they are all leaders of color in our two counties with their ears on the ground doing tremendous work. And so they are actually advising us and our programmatic staff on what is happening in the community, what trends are happening. And if you, as you can imagine, the last year, it was incredible to have their voices in the foundation and at the heart of our work. So that's one thing I want folks to know that, you know, I take it very seriously. We can't be all places and in every neighborhood and, and, and you know, knowing all that's going on and these incredible community leaders have stepped up and said, yeah, we will be advisors to you. So I'm very, very grateful to the, our community advisory council. And then the second thing we did is launch, completely relaunch our grant making. We uh, launched what we are calling a community action grants program. And the first is a catalyst fund where we are serving organizations that are led by and serving people of color in basically every issue area from arts and culture, environment, health, media journalism, immigration, neighborhoods, faith, and civic participation. So we heard, heard people loud and clear that we needed to address all issues that are happening in our community. And these are, you know, we have rolling deadlines and we are not waiting months to get the dollars out, you know, um, and you, people can go on our website and see all the deadlines that are coming up and our staff are churning out these dollars. And they're, general operating support. So we're not making people jump through hoops. 
and they're open to organizations that have a clear focus on racial justice and a plan to center the community they serve throughout their programs and leaderships. And we're targeting also organizations with budgets of less than a million dollars. So these are can be emerging, smaller, and mid-sized nonprofits. And in later this year, we're also going to be launching what we're calling a movement building fund to support organizations that are doing grassroots organizing and advocacy to achieve systemic change, again, focused on racial and, and this time economic justice. And then we're going to also launch a fund that's specifically going to support leaders of color. We are going to invest in their leadership, in their capacity, in their ability to grow and to sustain the work that they've been doing. So we've been, we, we, are, we are aggressive and we're gonna be even more aggressive in terms of our investment in communities of color and their leaders. I think Angelica will, will be very pleased <laughs> with that answer. Just as a follow-up, yep. what, what are you doing with your donors to bring them right. along? Right, right. Racial so, yeah, it's, um, you know, I get that a lot. How are your donors feeling? Our donors are stepping up. Again, we, I mentioned the Black-led organization Giving Guide. So we put that out, and within <laughs> two to three weeks, we had over $5 million going out to the organizations in that guide. We uh, launched a racial equity and social justice page on our webpage, which I mentioned. People are going there, looking at the organizations and giving. We, we hosted specific donor meetings, webinars, <laughs> right? Because we were all on Zoom mm -hmm. uh, on bias and structural racism. Well, Stanford law professor Rick Banks, who's the founding faculty member of the Stanford Center for Racial Justice at the law school there. And uh, the Stanford psychology professor, uh, Jennifer Eberhardt, MacArthur Genius Award winner, and author of the critically acclaimed book, Bias. And, um, you know, that was an oversubscribed session. We had donors, again, with small accounts and large accounts, all listening in to learn about what they as individuals need to, to understand about their own biases and, and prejudice and racism in our, in our country. The, one of the most exciting things is um, we've just launched with 20 other foundations, the California Black Freedom Fund. It's a five-year, $100 million fund to support black power building in organizations and i say that and people don't understand what that means power building in communities of color basically means that we're allowing the communities to chart their own course chart their own agenda develop you know the path to have their own political and social and economic will and and leadership so um we've raised 36 million dollars already for that fund and we just launched it in february um the other thing is we have a flood and it, when i mean a flood our our corporate responsibility team and our donor engagement team have been inundated the last uh especially the last two days but the last few weeks around the hate that we're seeing with asian in the asian american pacific Islander community outflowing of where do we give who do we give to so yes i put the statement in solidarity with the asian American community, but we also fund local organizations and we're directing our donors to organizations, we're directing companies in terms of where they can give locally at the statewide and nationally against, um, you know, this, what we're seeing unfold um, daily. It's I'm getting a little tired of the hatred in this country. It's, it's yeah. um, pretty exhausting. The good news is our donors are asking and we're reaching out and we're letting them know where to give and and how how to how to step up because i'm sure most people are seeing the news and they're like what do we do how, what what can i do i don't even know where to give well we're helping them figure that out we're navigating that so that's just again just a few of the things that we're doing well again that's a lot and i really right. like the, the element of giving small groups self-determination yeah. To right. find your own direction. That's a lot of the work I've been doing. Oh, I know. Uh, I know. It's so great. So um, we're going to go to our next guest okay. question. Mm -hmm. This one is from Taryn Upchurch of the League of Women Voters. So here's Taryn. Okay. Can you tell us about what your team is working on to increase the scope of its impact in the areas of civic engagement and education? Thank you. So um, we call that civic engagement. Community engagement and education falls under the rubric of civic engagement at the Community Foundation, and it is the core of just about everything we do. And in 2020, it took front and center stage. Remember, we had a census, right? Then we yeah. had the elections. So the, um, we, were, we took a leadership role in the, uh, the Bay Area Census Funders Collaborative, which basically was a network of foundations in the Bay 
that provided census grants to nonprofits in the 10 Bay Area counties. Um, you know, we provided almost $300,000 in grants in 2018 and another $3.4 million grants in 2019 and 2020 to organizations specifically to get out the count in hard to count populations. Um, hard to do, it got harder to do is when the pandemic hit and trying to identify organizations that had the trust in neighborhoods that they would either open the door or they, you know, they had to get creative in terms of getting the count out. Um, it really helped in San Mateo and Santa Clara County. We had uh, some of the best response rates in California. Yeah. We still have more to, more to go though. The, the trust factor is huge. So the, again, that was one thing we did. The other thing was the elections. So um, some of this was around um, donor engagement uh, and how to, under, how to understand how philanthropy could really help with elections. So, and what was happening, right? But there was a lot of rhetoric in last year around the election. So in August, we had Stacey Abrams on a webinar with our donors, again, as you can imagine, oversubscribed. And it felt like I was back in grad school. She schooled me and many others on what was happening with voter suppression, you know, election efforts around the country and what it was taking to really get out the vote, particularly in, in traditionally lower voter turnout areas, as well as, you know, and most of those were communities of color and poor communities. And in December, we hosted a, a kind of a reflective webinar with our donors again about um, what happened and how did philanthropy really play a role. And we had some three, four key organizations on at, that taught a really key lesson um, that philanthropy really did step in and help ensure that local election officials around the country could run safe and smooth elections. And as we've heard, um, it was one of the smoothest and safest elections that we've had in a long time. And our donors gave over $500 million to civic engagement efforts in the last you know, few years. Um, and we are also, uh, we, you know, civic engagement is one of our key areas that we, will, we fund through our, our, our community catalyst grants. So um, just again, a taste of some of the work and it, it was um, monumental, I'd say in 2020, given everything that was going on. Yeah, important in 2020 and ongoing. Yes, absolutely. So the next question is from Brendan Rawson of mm -hmm. San Jose Jazz. Okay. Here's Brendan. Uh, it was back in 2008, over 12 years ago, when the Community Foundation eliminated the arts as part of the foundation's giving portfolio. What has changed in that time frame? Why now is the foundation deciding to invest in culture work? What do you hope the foundation will be able to achieve through this change? Thank you. So I uh, mentioned before the Community Catalyst Fund, and thank you, um, Brendan, for that question. Um, so under this new program, we try to reflect what the community told us they wanted, and um, they wanted us to be in issue areas. We got a lot of, you know, are you going to be back in funding the arts? So one, we wanted to be responsive to what we were hearing. And two, we know that arts and culture are critically important in terms of nurturing creative expression, self-expression, um, community values. And in a time when um, so much is at stake in terms of people's actual lives and in terms of their livelihoods, uh, whether they have jobs can get jobs, there's so much that is happening in our communities. The arts play a really critical role. So, um, you know, it's one of the issue areas that we are funding again. We closed our first, you know, for this for this uh, part of the year, we've closed our arts and culture RFP. We had 70 applicants um, and they will be announced at the end of this month in terms of who, who, will, who will get uh, funded. The other thing that we've done and, and done historically at the foundation is have what we call donor circles, giving circles, where donors get around, get together, co-fund in certain areas. So we have a donor circle for the arts. And at the beginning of the pandemic, these donors, you know, our staff worked with them. They really wanted to give to emerging organizations or, you know, organizations with smaller budgets. And particularly giving to those who were serving communities that were disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Um, so, you know, the great news is, yes, we're doing it with our own discretionary dollars, but we're also working with donors who absolutely get it and absolutely understand the importance of the arts. 
Thank you. Mayor Licardo has been looking for philanthropic help. Always. <laughs> Always. Uh, Always. And most mayors in the past have not, but we're yeah. in a different moment now. So he's looking for a way to expand the capacity of the city yes. to provide services. And I think you've been partnering yes. with um, some programs. What What have you been doing with the with Right. The I mean, that, the, that partnership starts, you know, few, it predates me with uh, San Jose Learns, SJ Learns. Um, which is an app to expand after school programs for, for children in kindergarten through third grade in San Jose. So we've helped, um, you know, helped get dollars to, to that effort. Uh, we worked um, with uh, in voter outreach this last year with 19 organizations in San Jose. Um, we, uh, y y through the recovery roundtable again, it worked with him in terms of well, how do we think about moving forward once we need to recover. Um, the other key piece that I want to highlight is Destination Home and the work that they have done in the city of San Jose and Santa Clara County. Um, and that is a close partnership with Santa Clara County, city of San Jose, major companies like Cisco. Uh, to, and the Destination Home did a phenomenal job in this last year, uh, helping getting cash assistance to families in need. They have a homelessness prevention system that they have developed with their, their public sector partners. Um, more is coming. I want to, I, you know, they are, they are a, one of our or kind of component organizations, if you will, is a, a technical term, but they are one of our component organizations. They are phenomenal and a model of what it means to do public private partnerships to tackle things like homelessness, to tackle things like how do you help people who are most affected by this pandemic. And, you know, with, with, we helped raise a significant amount of dollars through a regional response fund. And that went straight to Destination Home. And you know, they as of last month, February, thirty-six million dollars they have deployed to help fifteen thousand households. Wow! So uh, had to lift them up. Jen Loving and her team is—they are doing miraculous things, and um, we're just happy to be able to support them in the background, help raise money, um, and help them just do what they know how to do. Uh, so that's just one example, right? We play in the background. We don't need to lead, they lead, we just help you know, enable their work in the best way that we can. Nicole, we're almost out of time. Oh, we have one more question sure. from a guest. Mm -hmm. This is from Tamara Alvarado oh. of the Packard, Packard Foundation. Yes. And here's Tamara's question. Hi, Nicole. I'm curious what gives you joy? And I'm asking that question because you do so very much for our community and I'm so grateful. So I'm curious. What gives you joy? Thank you. You know, what gives me joy is that there's so many people who want to help their neighbors. That Silicon Valley, you know, has the rap, good or bad, that people are very centered on self and, and, and you know, self-preservation or movement of self economically and gaining more wealth. And, you know, we have this perception, but when you strip that away, there are so many people here who just want to give and help their neighbors. That gives me joy. I couldn't wake up and do what I do every day had that not been true. There is a soul here. It gets lost in all the hype of what Silicon Valley is. But when you get to the soul of this place, there are some really phenomenally good people that just want to know how to do the right thing. That's an excellent conclusion to this interview. Thank you, Nicole Taylor. Thank for being you. With Thanks me. for having me. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. We'll be back next month with Gene Cohen the new executive director of the South Bay Labor Council. Meanwhile, you can follow us on Facebook and you can also catch up on all our previous shows on our website at createvsj.org or on YouTube by searching for Create TV San Jose. And now that's all folks, thanks for watching.